It's three minutes past seven, so we'll get started. Just a little bit of housekeeping, everyone. Um, first of all, can everyone make sure that the mics are muted, please, um, throughout the presentation? Um, you will get a chance um, to for Neil and Ben to answer some questions at the end. Uh, if you put them into the chat uh, as we're moving through the presentation, uh, myself, Helen, uh, Lynn and Adam will try and pick some of them up. Uh, we'll answer what we can. There was quite a few questions came through uh, already when you logged in. Um, what I would say tonight is Ben and Neil um, have not got that Newcastle United hats on tonight. Um, so they will answer the best they can if there's any uh, questions around the club. But obviously with them not having the hats on, some of them won't be able to be answered. So you'll have to bear with the lads on that one tonight. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Thanks very much uh, for joining us again tonight uh, on our next coach development webinar. Uh, it gives us great pleasure to, to introduce two real special guests tonight, uh, Northumberland FA and Ben Dawson, uh, head of coaching at NUFC, um, UEFA Pro Licence Coach, uh, and Neil Winskill, uh, lead professional uh, PDP coach at Newcastle as well, and also a UEFA Pro Licence Coach. So a vast amount of knowledge and experience that they're going to share tonight with everyone. Um, maybe it's not for, well, we're younger, their uh, audience tonight um, will probably not remember um, the coach, the coaches clinic that both Neil and Ben were uh, really influential in uh, in putting on uh, a few years ago. Um, so it's nice to get them back for our for for our first real webinar, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a real insightful uh, event for everyone everyone tonight. So uh, Ben, if you would just Introduce yourself and a little bit about yourself and obviously uh, the coach development programme that you did a few years ago. Hi, thanks very much, Gaz. Um, it's obviously nice to see everybody, some familiar faces and some some new ones joining the you know the cohort of coaches that we have up in the in the northeast. Um, I think when we initially spoke, we you know we'd said about our coaching journey and you know how we've ended up where we've ended up. Um, I'm going to use flip charts tonight. Neil's going to use the PowerPoint. I'm on flip charts, so if you can't see it, you need to let us know. But I've done my best. Um, apologies for the drones as well. They're not as good as Neil's. If you've seen some of his artwork, um, it's a tree, not a stick of broccoli. If Neil tries to correct you. Um, what I was just going to share just very quickly in terms of my, my coaching journey. Um, I went through the, the original junior team managers at, at 16 with uh, with Rob Atkin up at uh, Ridley Middle School in Blythe. Very quickly then onto the uh, level two with Rob and Barney. And then through onto the, the B licence, uh, which was with Barney at the Wind Jones Centre. I think after, after I finished school at sixth form, I used to head to the Wind Jones Centre on a Tuesday and a Thursday for the lectures. Um, well, that was all by the age of 18. Um, and I remember thinking when I'd finished that, I couldn't see the wood for the trees. Hence the, the picture of the tree behind us. Um, I've been asked a lot recently about, you know, individuals coaching journey and how long should I wait before I do this qualification or apply for that or before I go for this job. And I'll probably spend the next 10 years before my year license, learning my craft um, and spending some time getting out and, and trying to find out who were the best in the business, going and seeing them work, speaking to them, spending hours on the grass, coaching, not just on the grass, but in school dinner halls, um, on park fields, on uh, street corners, um, doing all sorts just to improve as a coach and with, with various groups of people. Um, the second bit with the diagram is is the uh, is the flag, the Northumberland flag. I think we're really fortunate. We, as in all the coaches that are on here tonight, we're really fortunate. Um, I was really fortunate initially that 
I had some great tutors on those qualifications, but I also worked alongside some some good staff at the football development scheme um, based up at Benwell. Um, and then obviously, you know, like I said, in terms of we as a collective, everybody tonight being fortunate, I don't think we realise how good, um, how experienced, enthusiastic, knowledgeable the coaches are in this region. Um, and they're always willing to give up that time. Um, I'm hoping that you tonight obviously feel that this was worthwhile and, and that there's something, you know, even if it's just one thing you can take away with you to, to help you improve. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to the next hour and a half. Over to you, Neil. OK, uh, so I started coaching at the age of um, 17. I was uh, released at Newcastle United as an apprentice uh, at the age of 18, but I'd already started doing a bit of coaching by then, and, and it just seemed like the natural thing to do. And I was involved with what was then called uh, Killamath Boys Club. So I spent about four years working with a group there um, before I was lucky enough to get some paid work with Rob Atkin at the Football Development Scheme, which was a part of the City Council. Um, I spent a lot of years there. I then left there to go and work for Newcastle United Foundation as the Football Development Manager. Uh, and I was then asked if I would like to go and work at the Academy, which, to be honest, I've worked at the Academy. I was just counting back today since 1998. So I've been I've been there a long time, uh, and that's that's where I am presently. Um, and I can just echo everything Ben said, Gary, about the coach the coach clinics and what was before that was the Northumberland Coaches Association. So this this initiative has been going a hell of a long time, and it's absolutely brilliant to see it back. It's it's long overdue in my opinion, uh, and thank goodness it's it's here again. Um, I've been really fortunate, like Ben. I, I was I was thinking today. I've, I think there's six people. If I was to categorise the six people who have had the biggest influence on me in my coaching, uh, three of them are mentors, uh, Rob Atkin, uh, Barney Jones and Terry Mitchell. And I've had three coaching buddies who I've worked with a lot on the grass and spent a lot of time with them actually working with players. Uh, uh, and that would be Ben, uh, Gary Middleton uh, and Liam Bramley. And I believe all of those people are on this webinar tonight. So we're still here. We're still going strong. And I think it's the beauty of what this is about. It's about bringing coaches together. It's not prejudiced about whether you're level one, UEFA pro, whichever age group you work with. Uh, it's just about coaches getting together and uh, sharing the passion for helping players learn. And um, I'm a bit like Ben. I've been asked so many times over this lockdown period what advice I would give to coaches. Um, if you're not careful, I think you can drown in online content. And then there's so much of it going around. And at, at, at this moment in time, I can't do anything about it than, than, than have that as the, as the medium. Um, but once things get back to normal, which is hopefully soon, there is nothing like seeing coaches working on the grass and getting up close and personal and asking those questions that you, you want to ask, the pertinent questions that matter to you. Uh, and I think hopefully once, like I say, once we get back to normal, Gary, we can get those events up and running again. Mm -hmm. And you, you can get and get along and see people working with players and, and pick their brains, which is what it's all about. Yeah, great. Thanks, Neil. Uh, just before we start, um, this has been recorded the night tonight. So, you know, if, if anyone wants to go back and look at something double check something Neil said, Ben said, it will be on our website uh, probably by tomorrow, Helen, Helen will have it on. And if there's any questions that people have that isn't relevant really around what Ben and Neil are presenting on tonight, by all means, email me over the next day or so and I'll get back to you with whatever around that is. Okay, uh, fantastic. Right, Ben, uh, over to you with Think, Plan, Do, Review. Can we flip shots? Hopefully it doesn't leave any greasy marks up well. But <laughs> not mine. Uh, yeah, so obviously we we've spent Neil and I and gone back and forward with, with Gary, but we spent a bit of time thinking about the, the topic and, and what we could do because it's it's such a a vast subject. Um 
And what we've decided to do tonight is probably try and give you a, certainly from my point of view, give me give you a little bit of an overview of kind of the, the things that I have to think about now in my role as head of coaching. And then once I've kind of given you an overview of it, Neil will then give you a little bit more of the specifics about how it works, given that he's on the grass a lot more than what I am with the, the players at the moment. So the, obviously the, the first bit around thinking, and hopefully this covers some of the, the questions that came in earlier as well, um, is I go back to the level two in 98 and feel to prepare, prepare to feel. This is the thinking stage. This is where your, your planning and your preparation is the key bit for me. Um, and it's about being really clear about what it is that you want, what it is that you're working towards, what it is that you're hoping to achieve. Um, and I've, I've put a, a sequence up there just on the on the flip chart of how I think it, it kind of works. Um, the terminology game model back in the day would have just been how do you want to play? You know, I think the game models are more more recent phrase or term to describe what it is. Um, but certainly being crystal clear in every moment of the game what it is that you want and how you're going to teach it. So whether you're working with the under fives at Killingworth, um, what does their game look like? What is it that you need to try and replicate and, and within that, the moments of the game? Um, at Newcastle, we've we've changed the programme to reflect that. So just just probably merging with the, the syllabus and the curriculum bit that's next on the list. Um, we've gone away from six-week schemes of work and blocks of work. And what we've tried to do is to make sure that we cover all four moments of the game throughout the week. We obviously have the luxury of, of you know, having contact with the players three, four times a week. And that makes our job a, a hell of a lot easier to be able to do that. Um, but we try to make sure that we do that now. Um, and that's where that, obviously, seasonal plan or periodisation, you know, comes in for us. So for the, the 9s to 16s, their season set out for them what topic they're working on, when they're working on it, what the objectives for the session are. Um, and the coach's job is then to to plan within that, plan the practices and, and to think about probably the next steps on there. Think about what's age appropriate. So, um, you know, some of the topics and some of the things that we ask in our game model, we've split it to make it more age appropriate. So there's a, a 9s to 11s version, a 12s to 14s version, and then a 15s to 23s. 15s to 23s obviously encompasses the, the vast amount of detail that would go into it. 12s to 14s a little bit less, 9s to 11s a little bit less. Um, just to get that age appropriate element. Um, and then get the coaches to think about, are you trying to teach principles of play? And then underneath that, the, the sub or the sub-sub principle. So basically, these things here, would what are your key factors? What is it that you're working towards? So if I give you an, an example of, so in our game model, um, 15s to 23s, the pitch is split, in, split into quarters rather than thirds. So you've got play out, play up, which are the two quarters before you hit the halfway line. Then you've got play through and play in in the attacking half. Now, for the, the 12s to 14s, we take out the defensive midfield zone, so they'd have play out, play through and play in, working on thirds. 9s to 11s would work on halves. They'd work on play out and play in. So we've tried to you know, reduce it down and make it more relevant for the, for the different ages. Principles of play stay the same. They've been the same since, you know, that level two B license course I was on at 18, they haven't changed. So it, you need to be absolutely clear in your own mind about what these are 
Um, it's probably one of the concerns I have when I speak to coaches now. And if I was to ask people on the on the call tonight, I'm not going to put people on the spot. But if I said to you, what are the attacking principles of play? Would people know? So probably a little challenge for yourself to, to go away and think about, can you remember or do you know what they are? And then what are the bits that, that underpin that for, for your other stuff? Um, and that's where those individual needs come in, right across the board there. So, yes, it's good having a game model. Um, but for us that are working with younger players, even at the academy up to 23s, even at first team level now, you've seen the introduction of, of first team development coaches. What are you doing for the individual? Um, because the day and age that we're in now, if you're not catering for the individual, they'll be going and getting it elsewhere. The first team players do that. Our academy players do that. You've got to try and cater for their individual needs. So it's getting that, that balance for me of, yes, we want this, this game stuff. It gives you an idea of how, you, how you're going to break your session down, how you're going to plan your objectives and what you're working towards. But you also need to consider the individual within all of those, all of those phases and stages. Neil? Oh, me. Okay, I'm just going to share the screen, Gary. I'll just see if... Uh... See if I can get it to work. Yeah. Yeah. You got that? Yeah. Okay. So I would just endorse everything Ben's said, really. Um, when, you, when you're sitting thinking about what, what it is you're going to work on with your group, uh, it, it, the, the inspiration comes from three or four different places. I think it, it comes from a, a game model or a syllabus or a curriculum something that's pre-planned over a long period of time and that you work from that week by week. Um, it, it also could come from uh, the necessity to plan for a game or it could be something that you're working on from the last game. So the, the inspiration for your session could be from, from you know upcoming or past games um, or it could be from just the pure needs of the players, what you think they need. So it's not anything that you've planned long term. It's not something that's based around the game. It's just something that you think they need at that moment in time. Um, and I think wrapped around all of that, you're always conscious as a coach of looking at what the modern trends in the game are as well and where the game's going and what the players are going to need to be good at in the future. And that's kind of where I've took this little bit from tonight. Um, and I thought I would, I would just have a little look at a modern trend um, and, and maybe break it down and use that as the, the way of explaining the thing that Ben's just talked about. So things that you hear lots of at the moment, you hear lots of people talking about a low block, um, which is, in my world, is defending deep. Um, you hear a lot of people talking about transitions, um, which, again, in my world, is winning the ball or losing the ball. And that's kind of where I went. I went down that route a little bit because I think you see now on the TV last night, you watch the game when a team's well organised defensively, it's very hard to break it down. So that moment where a team's been attacking and just lost it is a great opportunity for the team that's just regained it to maybe go and score before the other team are back set up and organised and compact. So I decided to go down that route and, and down that modern trend. And uh, the skill that I've picked, and I'll explain why I've picked it in a minute, the skill I've picked is intercepting. Uh, intercepting the ball and I seen I seen a stat a while back and it, it got me intrigued and I've kind of followed it up and hence I'm at this point now with it um, and the, the, the stuff I'm going to share with you is about intercepting the ball but trying to do it cleanly so when you've when you've intercepted it you're actually then able to go and continue playing and attacking from there um, so the stats, the stats that I saw initially were, if you go back to the Champions League last season, the top four teams who ended up in the semi-finals, um, there was some stats produced on which players in their team were the best at ball recovery, getting the ball back for their team. And the broke ball recovery down 
into uh, interceptions and tackles. And of the 12 players, uh, there was so there was Barcelona, there was Liverpool, there was Spurs, and there was Ajax with the four teams. The top three from each team, so the top 12 players all together, ball recovered, the, the best players had recovered the ball more times on interception uh, than they had on an tackle. So they're getting it back via interception more. Ten of the 12 had interceptions above tackles. Um, and in the same in the same tournament, another side stat, was that 50, 50.6% of the goals that were scored in the whole competition in the Champions League were from regains in the final third. So for argument's sake, a team building from the back, losing it, and the other team getting it quickly and going scoring, or a team attacking... They lose the ball in that final third and they very quickly ambush and get around it and get the ball back really quickly. Again, you hear the word counter-pressing being used a lot, uh, getting it back and scoring on that regain. So those were the stats. I, I started thinking that's interesting. I'm going to start following that up. So then I started looking at what, what happens once you've intercepted it. So if you think about the Premier League, average interceptions per game, 20. About 20 interceptions per game. The top player in the Premier League for intercepting at the minute is Wilf Ndidi at Leicester. Um, and if you then think about the team that's just won the Premier League, if you think of Liverpool, uh, once they've intercepted the ball or they've counter-pressed and they've got it back, then what happens after the interception? So that's kind of like phase two. So being organised to, to get the ball back is one, but then once you've won it, and hopefully you've won it cleanly, what can you then go and do next? So again, Champions League, average goal time from a regain of possession was 12.5 seconds. And that was under four passes. So that's how fast people are in, in the top teams are at winning it and scoring 12.5 seconds. If you then look at the eventual winners, Liverpool, Liverpool's was 7.8 seconds. So they're shaving, you know, five seconds off that overall average. So they're getting it back and scoring within 7.8 seconds and they're doing it in under two and a half passes. So there's something about intercepting and then there's something about the counter-attack. And that's the idea that I would use to, to explain this little piece of work. And then I'm going to sh show later on a little bit how I would then go and develop it on the pitch. OK, so I hope you can see this. OK, this is a team I've been looking at this season. I hope everyone can see it. If you can't see it, you'll be getting this on YouTube, I think, at some point. And if anyone wants the slides, just get in touch with me and I'll send you the slides through. It's not, not a problem. So this team that I watched, uh, including pre-season and including set play goals, scored 58 goals. And that's where the finishes took place. So the last finish, before it hit the back of the net, that's where the goals were scored from. The numbers on the circles represent the number of goal across the season. So, obviously, you can see number one there is pretty close to the top. That was the first goal of pre-season. And then it works its way through. And I think there's somewhere 34, which is in a green with black writing. That was the last goal before lockdown in the league. Um, so, that's one thing. If you trace that back, I've traced that back to where they won the ball back, where that regain site was. Um so if you see the, the numbers there, that's that's where the ball was won and the slide before was where it ended up. And underneath the goal, I've put the time it took from the regain to it hitting the back of the net. Obviously, I haven't done that for the white circles because they're set plays. But I've done it for all the ones in, in live play. Uh, if I take some of those off, those ones there with the, the shadow around the outside of them, those were regains via interception. So not tackles, not anything else via interception. I think there's seven ways to regain possession. And interception is one of them. And those were all the goals that resulted uh, from an interception. And then obviously the times underneath. And all I've done there is I've just drawn, I've put the goals back on, the finish back on. I've drawn a line between where the regain happened and where the goal was finished. OK, so 
if I then if I give you the headline numbers based on those those pieces of data that I've found, uh, if we break that down by third, so there was 18 times the team won the ball back in that attacking third of the pitch and then went and scored quickly. 21 times they won it in the middle third of the pitch and then went and scored. And there was six times they've won it really deep in their own third or in the penalty area even. And they've then went up the other end and scored. OK. That's all of the goals this this uh, this season that I've watched. 49% of them were via interception. So 49% of the goals that the team scored pre-season through to now were via interception first. And I just think that kind of highlights the importance of being able to intercept the ball. And if you add the set play goals on top of that, that would account for 67% of the goals this team scored. So two-thirds of the goals, interception, set play. Um, if you took all of those numbers, which I have done because I've been really bored, and if you worked out the average, the average goal time from the regain was 16 seconds. Now, I think that puts into context Liverpool, 7.8 seconds, which is incredible. So this team here is 16 seconds. OK. Um, in this final slide, and I'll tie it all up after this one, those, those times across the bottom and those coloured sections on the pitch represent UEFA's classification of what a counter-attack would be. So if you look on the left, in that dark green strip across the penalty area, if you win the ball back there and go right up the other end and score past the orange goalkeeper in under 15 seconds, that would classify as a counter-attack goal in their stats. Obviously, the closer you get to the goal, uh, they're giving you less time to then go and score and finish. So if I looked at the goals that this team scored across the season, um, there's only four of them that would actually count as counter-attack goals. So you're probably thinking, well, well that's great, Neil, and I, I probably can't even see it, to be honest, because the screen's that small. If, if you then if you sit and watch the game, not as a supporter, and you watch the game, whether it's your team's game or whether it's a game on TV, if you watch the game with your coach's eyes in, and you're really focused on something that you're interested in or you want to look at and you want to examine and explore, like I've kind of done with this one, um, it throws some interesting stuff up. So if I was working with this team, uh, I think they're pretty good at intercepting the ball. 50% of their goals come from interceptions. If I could make them even better at intercepting, that goals tally would go up, you would think. Um, but then when I look at the counter-attacks, they're probably not as productive as what they could be in, in terms of UEFA's classifications. So I might want to work with this team on making that strength of intercepting better, but I also might want to put the second part in of making the, the counter-attack bit slicker. Um, so that's just that's kind of some data that I've, I've kind of been looking at and, and working on just to see whether that's a trend in the game. Um, if I just come out of this, I'm going to show you three goals. One of them is one of my favourite goals of all time because um, it's my type of football. It's the first one. But then I'm going to show you two other goals that Liverpool scored just to show you how how good they are intercepting and how quick they are counter-attacking from it because they've won it cleanly. OK, so hopefully you can see that. This is the first one. This is Dortmund a couple of seasons ago. So, ball with Freiburg. Great interception. Won it clean. He's actually passed it first time off the interception. Bang, bang, bang. Finish. 8.8 seconds from the regain, from the interception. Here's Liverpool. Misplaced pass, interception, play forward. And then it's a speed. Just pure speed and positivity of playing forward. And then you've got guys at the top end of the pitch who are as clinical as that. 10 seconds. So before uh, Burnley have probably even realised that they've lost it, it's in the net at the other end. Uh, and this is decent as well. Again, interception, playing forward. It's the speed of the attack. And then that's not a bad finish neither. 7.7 .7 seconds. So there's kind of some examples. And as Ben goes on to the next bit, I'll come back to how would you develop that on the pitch. Okay. Oh. 
Okay, right, I've now got to unshare this, Gary. <laughs> that we're back? Yeah. Done. Over to you, Ben. Back to me. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's fair to say that from the the two bits that Neil and I have both spoken about, um, the model that I've got up on the top here around the objectives, which is our model at the club, is it's football first. So at the moment, we focused on the football in terms of the thinking. So what is it that you're going to work on? Well, it's football. And that accounts for us for the biggest bit, the biggest circle around the outside. Um, and that always comes first in the planning. So for Neil's examples tonight, it's going to be around intercepting, but intercepting cleanly. And then the regain element of how do you then go and counter or what do you do if you can't? Um, now, within that, depending on, again, which team you're working with, who the players are, etc., you're then starting to think about, so the FA has the, the four-corner model, but you start to think about those other objectives, so the physical, the psychological, and the social. And are there specific ones that the players need? Are there specific ones that the group needs? Is there something specific that ties in really well with the topic um, but those need to be considered at the same time and underneath that I'm hoping that everybody's familiar with that in to the step method or the step principle um, and, and Neil and I had the discussion about well what does that do and I think the the common terminology is it's constraints. We knew it as it's conditions. But then the things that you need to think about to achieve these objectives, whatever they are, these are the ways in which you do it. Now, for you, particularly the ones who are working in grassroots football and even in, in academy football as well, or senior football, you've got to think about the space. So... If Neil's, if Neil's wanting to do intercepting, winning the ball cleanly and breaking from and practice that nine-second one, which is was in the middle of his own defending half, if you've got a third of a pitch for an under-16s team, you're probably going to have to think of different ways to do that because of the space that's available to you. What space do you need to be able to do it? Now, you might have to then manipulate some of these other things to create the conditions that you need. Ben, can I just stop you there? Could, yeah. could everyone just switch off their cameras, please? Because I think we'll get a better view of your flip chart paper, Ben, because I'm struggling to see some of it as well. So if people can just switch off their cameras, um, Ben, you should be focusing a little bit more. Yeah, that's better. Danny, can you switch off your camera, please? Barney. If you just click on the camera. Yeah. Barney, can you just click on your camera for me, please? And then we'll not see you. You're always trying to get in the shot, Barney, isn't he? <laughs> Go on, Ben. Anyway, that's much better than now. Yeah, so just in terms of recognising that space element around what it is that you want, what is it that you need, and that's where you might have to compromise a little bit about how you're going to achieve some of those objectives. The second one's either time or task. So again, you know, if, if we're working three, four, five sessions a week, you know, with the, the lads at the academy, over the course of a season, we can effectively plan that. If you've got an hour a week with a grassroots team um, and you're at Bead Academy on a, a third of a pitch, you got to work out, well, what am I prioritising in terms of time here? How long am I going to spend on the, on the practices themselves? 
to create the opportunities. So if Neil's talking about nine seconds from that middle of your you know, defending half, well, then that might be one of the conditions that you put on. So let's say you've got a third of a pitch and you go 6v6 six six on the third. It's quite a long pitch if you're going across it. But does one team have the, the nine-second condition on? They win it in their own half. You've got nine seconds to score to get them used to moving it. That's one condition you can place on it. Um, equipment. So have you got the necessary equipment to be able to do it? Um can you manipulate some of the equipment to change the conditions for people? So is it the size of the goal? Um, is it using um, other pieces of equipment to try and highlight elements? So it might be within the counter-attacks that initially um, you want the first pass to, to break a line or you're trying to break a line with your first touch. So you might put lines across the pitch and say, look, when you intercept, you need to try to get your first touch across the next line, as an example. You might put gates in wide areas and say, look, if you, if you can break through the middle, it's worth two. If you have to break wide through the gates, it might only be worth one because it's going to slow you down. And then the last one, just about manipulating the players and how you set that up. So again, you know, there's there's loads of talk about um, using floaters, or do you go odds versus evens? Do you stack the numbers in one favour rather than the other? Now, for the the younger ones, you might go seven v five on the break, so that you can get some success. You might then, with the older ones, you might start to you know bring it back closer to to six v six. You might go the other way. You know, where a team doesn't necessarily push everybody on when they're attacking. But when you win it and hit them on the break, you might be outnumbered yourself as the attacking team. You might only have a front four attacking against a back six because they've left their full backs and two holding players back. So that for me has always been something that I've gone back to when I've worked. I just think about those things to change the conditions, to try and better achieve what it is up here. Um, and again, just being really, really clear on this bit about what it is that you want and how you can change the conditions to achieve it. Neil? The mic on that might help, but might I thought you were ignoring us, guys. I'm saying, guys, is that on? Is that on, guys? Nothing, yes, got that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So, again, just to just to take a step back, ben, Ben's hit the nail on the head there. It's about intercepting cleanly, and it's then about counter attacking quickly to try and score before the other team get organized. So these are, I know we've had a lot of virtual quizzes over this last four months. There's some good trivia questions in here. Seven ways to get the ball back on a regain. There's one. Um, I'll leave that one with you. Uh, Newcastle United's number one interceptor. Five second countdown. Isaac Hayden. Isaac Hayden. Um, so it's, it's, it's taking this now, like Ben says, use that step principle, that step model. And I think most people will have seen uh, something like that on their FA awards and then trying to build a session together. Um, going back to the analysis stuff, sorry, uh, that that was me sitting watching stuff on a laptop or on, on, the, on the TV and scribbling on a pad. Um, if you've got an, an, an analyst easy for me to say, who can do that stuff for you, great. Um, I think it's quite interesting to do it yourself if you've got the time and, and we've had plenty of that. So it can be done yourself. It can be done watching a game, a run of games, whatever it might be, on something you're interested in. Um, but if it was your game on a Sunday and you're standing watching your team play in a, in a field somewhere, 
Uh, there's nothing to say that your substitutes couldn't do that or your assistant coach could do something like that and do some hand-drawn, uh, annotated analysis yourself. So it doesn't have to be highfalutin um, graphics. It can just be some basic things that just help inform your coaching. Okay. So just on to building the session, what I've kind of, what I've tried to do here, and I know I've sat in on quite a few, well, I say quite a few, maybe four or five webinars over the period and I hope my ears always prick up when they suddenly start talking about sessions and session practices and stuff like that. Um, so I've put four here and I've tried to cover across the spectrum. So some stuff that's um, really technical based, really isolated, unopposed, um, but with lots of repetition. So if you've got small numbers or you want to work with some specific players, then there's a practice here at the beginning that may be good for that. But then I've went across the spectrum and tried to move up towards... Uh, the, the real game, if you like, and into an 11 v 11. But what I would say is the numbers on everything can be changed. The conditions on everything can be changed. So go back to Ben's step model. You can you can adapt these practices to anything you want them to be for your group. Um, but these are the way I've I've done them in the past. So I just thought I'd share them ones, these ones with you. I'll talk about the key details as we go through. OK, but I suppose as, as you're watching the first one here, key question is, what, what do you have to be good at? to be good at intercepting. And it's too easy to say, well, you've got to be able to read the game. Well, how do you do that? What What, what is it I have to practice and what is it I'm looking for to be really good at that? Um, so I'll talk through the practices as we go. So this is the first one. So number four is going to do the work. So Fabinho, uh, and initially he's going to respond to the coach's command. So you can see the setup uh, and it's, it's rapid fire. This The, the animation probably is a, doesn't do it justice in terms of how fast it needs to be done. OK, so the coach is going to call out uh, a colour. Four presses the colour, the mannequin, back. Shouts a different one, back. Always going back to the D. Shouts the final one and then back. Now, you can see there the coach has held up a bib. The bib will either be red or yellow. This makes number four look. He has to get his head up and, and see what's happening in front of him. He's lifted the red bib. That means the reds are going to try and score into the goal next to them. But it's going to go seven, eight, and then into the nine goal. OK, the four's got to stop it. So the four's on his way back into the D, intercepts. OK. Now, if he intercepts, you can add a second part onto this. Because if he's won it cleanly, like he has done there, you would want him to do something with it and you'd want him to play forward. So I might say here, then, OK, find the coach in between the mannequins somewhere. And I might actually say to the red number eight, you've got to stop him. So there's a point for the, uh, for the number four. OK, so... However many you want to press, 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 press. Coach holds a bib up. Player has to get their head up and see what's happening in front of them. That triggers the pass off. And there's two passes. The second pass being a one into the number nine, which is the goal. Four's got to get across via the D to intercept it. OK. If he intercepts, find the coach. Now, if you want to, again, if you want to add a reward on the end of this, because the number four might go through the motions. OK. Uh, you might actually give the four a chance at goal so number four has just intercepted the ball he's passed it back to the coach through the mannequins and as a reward he gets a, a chance to go and finish in the goal against the goalkeeper so the, the guy you, next to the football who hasn't worked yet which is the yellow 11 he's crossing it and the four's trying to score if you want to keep with this the theme of intercepting you could have the opposite server coming in to try and finish that cross. Number four is actually recovering to defend and intercept the cross. Again, depends on how you want to do it. So the number four is getting a chance to press, a chance to intercept a pass into the nine and potentially intercept a cross. Or if you want to do the reward bit, he gets a chance to finish. Okay. Key things I would look for in here. Uh, it's the ability to move across the grass quickly. Anyone who's uh, going to be decent at intercepting is going to have to be able to cover ground. And that might be sideways, it might be forwards, um, or it might be actually off a recovery run facing your own goal like that. Um, so at that practice there, I would use for footwork and for covering the grass quickly. Um, there's probably a million other things you could do with it in terms of uh, reading people's body language, etc. But I'm going to kind of get into that in the next one. OK, so that's practice one. Fairly basic, small group of players. And if you notice, that took all the midfield players for that one. OK, here's practice two. Uh, 
anybody who's watched me work over the last three or four years or has worked with me will know I love a rondo. I'm, I'm not a massive thing of calling them rondos. I call them tactical possessions. Um, but I've got a million of these and I roll these out daily. Uh, I think the players enjoy them and I think there's loads of things you can do with them to get the thing that you want uh, to happen. So four on the outside, working the lines, 10 in the middle in the box, two defenders, four and eight black, uh, four mini goals on the outside. So the guys on the outside, they're just keeping possession and they can use the 10, that scores them a point. Into the 10 scores you a point and you're working the ball, keep ball, five against two on the outside. Okay. Uh, the two blacks have to win the ball and you're going to see that happen here. Okay. But again, to keep with this, the theme of intercepting, to give the eights, the seven, the nine and the 11 for the reds a chance to practice as well. When the two blacks win it, they need to score quickly in one of them goals in the eight. In this case, just too slow to intercept it. Okay. So 5v2, little keep ball. Work the two guys in the middle. Uh, there's a second, a second uh, counter-attack opportunity there where the, the Reds get the chance to intercept. But then you're working on the two defenders, winning it cleanly and hopefully being able to then play forward and score. OK, coach at the side with a good supply of footballs, ready just to keep the practice moving quickly. OK, Ben Ben will tell you a little bit probably when we come off here about why we use people on lines, which I think is a really good point worth making, but I can't take any credit for that because it's Ben's, Ben's thing. OK, practice three, pretty similar, a bit more in shape this time. So if you notice on that last one, I took the midfield players. This one, I've kind of took the back players and the forwards. Uh, I've got two, three on each side. I've got number four in the middle uh, and there's two centre-halves and two centre-forwards, if you like, per team. So 4v4, yellows against reds in the middle. Goalkeepers at each end, serving the balls in. Practice starts. It goes into the yellows. Yellows have got to get the ball to the goal at the opposite end. They can use any of the blacks and they can use the, the, the number four in the middle as well. I haven't mentioned touch conditions. If you want to put things on one touch or two touch, a bit like Dortmund, you can. Uh, your call really on this one. But the blacks on the outside are working the lines again. So here, five, place the two. You can see the 10 and the nine for the Reds trying to protect the ball going into four. Unfortunately, they don't do well enough and it goes through and you find the goalkeeper. There's a point. OK. What you'd normally do here is to say, OK, then let's go the other way now and play back into the, the yellows and we'll go the other way. What you end up with there is that the nine and the ten end up being kind of like the centre-halves. If you want to do that, great. Personally, I would probably say here, let's go back to the Reds. So it's 1-0. Reds are now getting a turn to do the same thing. Not as good as the other team. Intercepted by the nine. Nine quickly finds the goalie before the Reds can get back in and recover. 2-0 to the yellow team. OK, back into the Reds. OK, slightly different pass this time. This is a bit like the second goal on the video I showed you. Tries to find the nine, six intercepts, quick combination, and they're out again. 3-0 to Dortmund. Reds are getting walloped. OK, if you want to add a transition element into this, you could. You could have the, the, the team that um, concedes the goal getting off onto the lines and the team that's on the lines coming into to play and getting the ball and trying to go the other way. You could add that if you wanted to. Um, I've just kind of kept it simple uh, for that one. OK. All right. And the final one. Uh, this is probably more the type of work I would I would have done over the last couple of years. Um, I've used 11 v 11 here, but I think the principle you could take and I think you could apply it to different numbers, whether it's 8 v 8, 9 v 9, whatever. Um, I've just highlighted the middle third, which was kind of the area that a lot of those goals come from in the team that I analysed. I think it was 20-something, 20, was 20 something, 28 off the top of my head. Goals came from that middle third of the pitch. So it's the Reds against the Blacks. The Reds back four are in white bibs. So they're differentiated from their, their teammates so you can see them. Um, I'm going to put them on three touch for this and they can't be tackled. So three touch for the Whites, they can't be tackled. So here... The shift in the ball across the back four can't be tackled. Six then tries to play one into midfield and it's intercepted by number four for the blacks. Um, OK, so this is the thing about being organised, being compact, sliding and screening, intercepting cleanly and then going breaking. OK, at this point here, uh, 
only the whites, the back four, are going to defend against all of the black team. And I've put the times on the top there just for this practice. So 15 seconds you've got to score in the back third. 10 seconds they've got to score where they've won it there. This is the creative bit for the players. They've got 10 seconds to score. There's the win. It's 11 against four. Or 11 against five, including the goalie, sorry. And what can they come up with to finish? Now, if you notice on the diagram, I've moved the, other t the rest of the players as well. Because if they take longer than 10 seconds, the game's live again. Um, if the goalie was to catch that after four seconds, because they've attacked and he's made a save, then we're distributing them, we're playing live again. But the four defenders in white are unopposed. Okay, now you can change the, the, the dynamics of that, like Ben said. You could have only the back four plus the whole midfield player can defend. Uh, only three of the back four can defend. The back four plus two hold midfield players can defend. You can change the, con the, the conditions on that to suit what you want. Um, but hopefully what you're going to get is some mid-block defending, some intercepting, hopefully, and then some counter-attacking. And you can play around with the numbers to, to get what you need. OK, final little bit. This is something that I would do before every session. This is just a personal thing. Uh, it's not normally as fancy as this. It's normally drawn down on a, on a piece of paper. Um, that's the layout of the session for the coaches. So that the, let's say there's there's three coaches working here: the lead coach, the assistant coach, and the goalie coach. And then you've got your possibly a fitness coach if you're fortunate enough to have one. That's the setup. Uh, that's where the practices are going to go. Fortunate this group have got a full size pitch, so it works nicely. If you haven't got a full size pitch, you've got to be really creative in how you how you manage this. Anybody who got any questions on that, speak to Terry Mitchell. Is the master of it. Um, so I've spread these out here. You can see where the practices are going to go and the sizes of the areas. Um, I'm also going to put on where the camera is going to be positioned. So that's the view that I want to see on the camera, which if you'll, you'll see it's behind the black team. So I want to see their shape from behind and I want to see them then hopefully intercepting and pouncing at the other end to score. You could change that to suit. I'm also going to put on there where the coaches are need needing to be. That's where I want them to stand. So they get the best possible view. And I'll come onto that when we get into the do bit in a minute. Uh, and I'm going to put where the ball banks need to be as well. So that prep's done before you even set on the pitch. Uh, and everything's organised, ready to go. OK, and then we're into the do bit. Always looks good on the, always looks good on the screen. And relax. Yeah, so yeah. That, that until the 23s come in, Nick, four players. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'll, go, I'll go back to the phrase at the very start. Feel to prepare, prepare to feel. Um, that level of planning uh, leaves no doubt, leaves no doubt in anybody's mind as to what is happening and what's expected and how we're going to try and achieve those those objectives. Um, and it allows you then as the coach to be really clear about what your job is at that point. And the doing bit for me, one, once you've you know got the practice, you know, the setup right, you're happy with it, you get it up and running, you explain the rules to the to the players, they're up and running. You're then on to probably one of the key key skills as a coach that you need, and that's learning to look. Um, I always remember somebody had said of his, and and I use it with my boys. You, you've got one mouth, two ears, and two eyes. Use what you've got more of. So less talk, more listening, and certainly as a coach, more watching and looking. And observing, and that for me is the, is the key bit on the on the doing. Are you clear in your in your thinking and in your planning about what it is that you're working on and what it is that you're going to be looking for? Um, I go back to my ear license, um, which I, I did with Liam, and Liam will remember the, the the same thing. You'll have a list of key factors now on your sheet that you're looking for and it's about then looking for them in order so 
you've got A, B, C and D. The first example that pops up might be C. Well, I'm just going to make a note of that. I'm going to need to remember it, but I'm, I'm looking for an A. And it keeps going and going and going. And then you get to a point where, have I seen A or not? If I've seen it, was it a good example that I need to highlight? Or is it something that needs an intervention or something to work on? Or if I haven't had one, do I then maybe need to recreate one? So what you would call a staff position to create something and that might be because either the, because of you know the players decisions or whatever it might be a fault of the practice it, it could be a whole host of things but you need to stand back and look and as Neil's rightly pointed out you need to know where you're going to stand the things that I've, I've written down there around around the eye um, youth award module 2 relevance realism repetition so in your planning, hopefully there are things that you're trying to trying to get in relation to the topic and the objectives. All right, so you, you're looking for, well, is it relevant for their needs at this moment in time? Does it look real? So if Neil gets to the 11 v 11 bit of his, his game there, and it's 11 versus 4, but it's too easy. Then what's his decision then? Has he recognised it? And does he then know how to adapt it and make the necessary change? So he might then decide that, well, actually, I'm going to stick the, the two midfield players on how I'm going to put a white bib on and they can be involved in it. So the observations are hopefully going to help you to make either the interactions, interventions, or to do the influencing that you need for achieving those objectives. But I think it's a real, you know, a real good example that Neil's given you there on that last slide about the importance of plotting where you're going to stand. And eventually you'll get to the point where it becomes habit and you'll know because you've done it that much. But certainly in the initial stages, plotting where you're going to be will allow you to, to, to look and to check either how you got those things and then how you're going to do these things within the practice. Neil? You're still on mute. That was my Norman Collier impression, for those who remember Norman Collier. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think I think this is the art bit, and this is the bit. This is the craft that I think Ben talked about earlier on. This this is the thing that takes it takes years. I sometimes question like during this season whether I'm any better now than I was 20 years ago when I first started. Uh, when you walk off the pitch, at times scratching your head. Um, it's the thing that frustrates you. It's it's the it's the real skill, the delivery bit, and and I'm not sure you could explain it in a webinar I'm not sure you could do it justice I think this is the thing like I said at the start it's about going and watching people on the grass working and seeing them doing it and seeing how they interact with people and what type of questions they ask and how they move the practice on and what type of things they're looking for and the coaching points that they give um, and the detail that they give ultimately I think that one of the best coach the coach events we had was Dick Bate um, God rest his soul and the, the level of detail that he gave on that night, but every time me and Ben have worked with him in the past, is incredible. And that just, it takes years to get that, I think. So that's that's what you've kind of got to keep working at every day as a coach. Um, the only the only other little bits I would add to, to Ben's thing is pr practice design's key. I will work off 14 practice formats. Uh, if you get the practice design right and you get what you want happening regularly enough, and the players are getting lots of opportunity to practice it without you having to do a great deal as the coach, then you're onto a winner. If you've then got some little golden nuggets of information that you can give that might just help improve the quality of the performance, then you're really winning as a coach, then you're doing well. Um, so details is important. You know, I, I go back to the thing where I said about reading the game. What is it you're looking for? 
So is it is it an interceptor? I'm trying to anticipate a pass. I'm looking at where the lighty receivers are. I'm looking at what eye contacts the person with the ball made with anybody that might give the game away. I'm looking at shoulders and hips because it's quite hard to hide those things unless you're someone like Francesco Totti or uh, De Bala or someone like that. Um, so I look at I look at eyes, I look at hips, I look at shoulders as things that might give me a clue. I look at back lift that might give me a clue. Um, but I also do my research and I know that if I want to stop Lionel Messi, uh, I'll stop Xavi because Xavi is the number one person that gives the ball to Messi. So there's a good chance when Xavi gets it, he's passing to Messi so I can be ready for that. So those are the kind of bits of detail that I'm on about. And then I think after that, it's like Ben says, it's using your eyes and not forget that there's potentially two or three of you and you've got two or three sets of eyes there. And then I get into the thing that I've done in the last webinar that some of the guys on here might have been on about gang coaching. How, do, how does the team of coaches work together to add value to the players? Whether that's me working with one team and Ben working with the other, whether that's me working with um, one topic and Ben working on the opposite topic, so we've got a competition happening, whether it's me working with the group and Ben working with, I don't know, the two central midfield players on trying to screen and intercept them passes that you've seen. It's using that gang of coaches to, to do that. And, and again, if you were on that webinar, I use, I think there was six different ways you could set that up where you're using two coaches um, and that just I, th I think that just rinses and squeezes everything out of the session that you can get making sure that there's not one working one coach working and one coach standing watching which was something that me and Ben learned way back at the development scheme days with Rob because nobody's going to pinch them footballs as you would say so the two years need to roll, roll your sleeves up and get in there um, and ball rolling time's a key thing. I know me and Ben have had this conversation lots about is, is it ball rolling time? Is it called something else? Is it about action time? What is it? And I'm not sure we're any closer to find that out, Ben. I know we've had many discussions about it, but if I go back to uh, my last season of coaching, uh, now is up to 71%, and I think that's too low. So a bit like now, I need to probably shut up more and let the thing happen. So that might be something that you keep an eye on and you, you maybe do some analysis on yourself to try and increase the ball rolling time. So it's always about the players playing. Done? Yeah. All right. Probably need one nicely then to the, to the review bit. Um, and two elements to it for me. Um... Uh, the first one is recognising that the review doesn't just come at the end. The review is actually something that you're doing all of the time. Um, the, the practices that Neil showed you earlier, they, they don't just uh, get knocked up on that first take. You, you get some notes down, you start planning, and then, oh, what about this? What about that? You're reviewing at that stage, in the thinking stage, in the planning stage, and in the doing stage. You're constantly reviewing, and it wraps around the whole process for me. Um, and I don't know whether that's just the way that we were, we were taught, when we came through the system with, with, with Rob and Barney and, and all the other people that we worked with at the Football Development Scheme when we started out, but you're always looking for things to be better. You're always looking for how how can I make it better so that the players get a better opportunity to develop and improve. So I think that that review bit around certainly in the in the in the thinking bit. Now, have you thought of every eventuality? It's a bit like going going back to again going back to the air license. I remember Liam and I had adjoining rooms at uh, Lillishall, and I remember I had attacking with a shadow striker for my final assessment at MB11, and Liam had dealing with a, a shadow striker out of possession, and we must have spent hours 
and you should have been with a tactics board going through all the possible scenarios that could happen. And it was, I was going to do this. And then Liam went, well, if, if you do that, I'm going to do this. Well, if you do that, I'll do this. And if you do that, I'll do it. And we spent hours on it. But that meant when we came to the, to the final plan, we knew. When we came to the doing bit, because we, we'd kind of gone through it in my head, we knew what we're looking for. And you're then thinking, do I need to make any of those changes to the practice or to the players or to the space or to the time that I need to to get more of the topic? And then at the end, one of the things I remember Barney writing in me in my B licence pack, I think I, when I did the log book, um, it was in the old red Velcro sticky, sticky thing, the, the little A5 sheets to do the sessions on and uh, were your objectives achieved and I'd put yes to all of them and it was a bit of a talk and gesture and I remember eagle eyed Barney in the, in the final assessment in the interview and he asked did you really achieve everything did the players achieve everything or do you need to go back and revisit it and I was yeah I probably do so it, was, it was taking a, a step back and, and not just, yeah, I think they got the hang of it. But what, what level of understanding and application do you want the players to have? Do you want all the players to have it? Is it a certain number of players or specific individuals that you want to have that? But reviewing it at each stage of that you know, think, plan, do model is critical. And then for me, I put there the three P's about, well, what is it that you're reviewing? So I think, first of all, it's a personal review. I think if something isn't working correctly or didn't work correctly or the player's understanding or application uh, wasn't quite right, the first port of call is you. Don't look for an excuse with the practice or the player's Look at yourself first. Go back to the thing, plan and do bit. Assess your own performance. Do a personal appraisal. Then you can start thinking about the practice. And then, finally, you can start reviewing the players. But for me, two key elements. Be the model. Thinking about reviewing at each stage. And then looking at the three P's for how you do review personal practice and, and players. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's it's a great model, the three P's. Uh, and I think Ben makes a brilliant point about looking at yourself first. Uh, I think there's a case, there is a case of having a little bit of healthy paranoia about yourself. Uh, when you second guess, you know, is, is this going to work? Is it good? Is there something better than this? Was that good today? Was it me? Could I have done something different to, to cover what I wanted to? I think there's, there's a good, there's some good stuff comes out of having that mindset, but it, it kind of go too far. Uh, and I think one of the things that a, a good coach and buddy of mine, Mr. Dawson, said to us this this year, it's never as never as good as you thought it was when you win, and it's never as bad as you think it was when you lose. So if you think of that from a coaching session point of view, when you think you've done a great one, it probably wasn't that good. And when you think you've done a horrendous session and hasn't been good at all, if you ask the players, they probably say, yeah, it was good, yeah, I enjoyed that. It, so it's never as bad as you think it is. But I think having that mindset where you're, like, you're questioning everything and you're, you're second-guessing things is good, as long as it doesn't go too far. Uh, I don't think you can review unless you've had objectives because you've got nothing to review against. So you've got to have, have two or three key objectives for the session, whatever they might be, technical things, physical things, whatever, tactical things. You've got to have some objectives. And I, I also think if you, if you look at those practices that I've done, I, I see the thing like simplicity is genius and simplicity is key. Um, if that's your motto, if that's what you believe in, cross-reference it when you come to review your session. Uh, if you believe in being a, you know, I'm a games-based coach, I don't do isolated practices, I don't believe in them, great, check that when you review your session, or you live in the things that you say you, you do. Um, 
So there's a lot of reflecting on yourself. It's easy to re- review the players. I mean, we're doing that every every weekend at the football ground somewhere. We're assessing and judging players, but it's quite hard to turn the, 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 the mirror onto yourself. Um, and I think there is a bit of... You can ask the players what they think. Um, I know I ask, I ask certain players if they enjoyed the session and what they liked about it, because I know I'm going to get some good feedback. Um, I can ask other players, and I might not, I might not get the feedback that's genuine, or it might just be what I want to hear. But there is, there is some that I'll target them for that. Um, if I've made a coaching point, I might ask a player at the end, did that, did that make sense to you? Do you want to tell me about what it is, what's talking about, and just cross reference to get some feedback from them. Um, and I think some of the times with that, you can. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big pre-planner as you can probably tell. Um, and I don't feel comfortable when it's ad hoc, just not the way I do it. I can I can do it, but it's not what I'm happy with. Um, so I think you can plan to speak to people. So as I'm walking across to a pitch, I might nonchalantly go and talk to a player and say, hey, what did you think of yesterday? Did you enjoy that? Was that session interesting? And did you like that, that rule that we had on the game at the end? Now, that might look like it's just an ad hoc conversation, but I've actually targeted the person uh, and uh, I want to find out. And I might do that at the end of this session as well. So there's a bit of a method behind it, I think. Um, and the final thing with me, I know people talk about spending equal time on plan. Yeah, think, plan, do, review. I think that's a great, it's a great thing, that. But... I think the co- the best coaches I've seen and that I've worked with spend ages on the, the think and the plan bit. What, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And then they're thinking about the practices that they're going to use, the simple practices they're going to use to get complex messages across potentially. Um, but but I do think the, think that the review bit at the end, I just find that can last as long as you want it to. I, I, my missus, can, when I come in the house after a session, she can tell straight away whether I've had a good day or a bad day. And she can tell you what the session was like. Was it a good session or a bad session? And I'm sure everybody can can kind of like understand that. And, and it affects you. You think about it. You go to bed thinking about it. You think about it the next day. And it, it potentially for some people might carry on for a week. You know, if you're lucky and you're working in a professional football club, you, 24 hours later you're back on. If it's a week, you get a week to stew on it, and a week before you can put it right. Um, so I think sometimes the review bit can last longer, and probably should last longer. Great, Neil. Sorry, Gary, I thought you were going to say, Neil, you're on no. there. Can you just say all that again? <laughs> we'll back the pen. Going to colour that tree in. <laughs> you're mute, Ben. You're mute. Sorry. Just speaking to Neil over the, the course of the last week and, and trying to pull together some of the, the bits for tonight, there's probably a couple of things that Neil said or alluded to in there. Um, and they're probably, you know, we've both experienced and probably both have the same mindset on. And uh, again, you'll have to excuse the dodgy pictures, but the top one's a fire hydrant. Um, getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. There's that much, and you don't know. It's coming from all angles, it's all over. Um, be really clear as a coach what it is that you want to get better at and then work out who are the best people to to observe or speak to and the bit in the middle is around time you have to put the hours in there's no shortcuts you can't just go on the internet and somebody's put their, their thoughts on a tactical analysis of Man City and it's like, oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Well, how do you know? Who's the person who's done it? Have you seen Guardiola work? Have, have you seen his training sessions? Have you watched every game that his team's played this season to get a good understanding of, of what it is that he does? That's putting the hours in. No shortcuts. And the same here with the, the road and the, the miles and, and the speed. There's no rush. 
there seems to be this uh, movement towards people wanting to achieve qualifications and jump job roles without actually taking the time to, to improve and get better. Take the time, do the hours, do the miles. Um, we're both still eager to learn, eager to improve and still doing the hours and the miles because we want to get better. And we, we know there's no shortcuts to that. And the final bit's just thinking back to the to the first picture and the first thing I said about when I was younger about not seeing the wood for the trees. Um, and it goes back to this US Navy SEAL discipline, design principle, motto, or whatever that I think Rob mentioned to us when I was 16 on the junior team managers. Keep it simple, stupid. Neil just talked about there about I think somebody's philosophy or values is around, you know, simplicity is genius. Same thing. Just keep it simple. And that comes from, from clarity and understanding what it is that you're trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve it. Anything more, Neil, on that? I'm just really impressed with Ben's memory. I can't remember what I was doing in February, never mind uh, when I was 16. The great I've had. I will am a lot younger than you, though, Neil, so my memory's a bit better. <laughs> yeah, great. I've just, Thanks. I've just Go on, Ben. Else, yeah, that, that Neil mentioned, you said about earlier about the practice, about being stuck on the lines. So just to explain to, yeah. to people, that was that was something that uh, the previous manager in terms of Rafa Benitez was something I picked up from him. Um, was when we do possessions or games with people on the outside, um, about having them stuck to the line, no grace, no dropping off three or four yards, because actually it makes it easier for you. It makes it easier for the person on the ball. If you have to stay on the line, you have to work harder to give the right angle of support. So it was a, it was a great message. And if, and if you have a go at a little, so I don't know, one of Neil's possession practices, but you say to the lads on the outside, you're not allowed to leave the line. You've got to work up and down it to give the correct angle. Um, it also means, actually, when you get on the bigger pitch, if you keep dropping off to give the angle, to give the depth, as you would call it, in terms of once you start getting into the sub-principles, you start dropping off to give depth. It invites the other team up the pitch to come and press you. So rather than... If the, if the right centre-back, for instance, is going to support the right back who wants to pass the ball to him, nine times out of ten, you watch the modern game, the right centre-back will drop off because it's easier. Gives them more time, gives them more space, but what it allows the other team to do is come up the pitch and start to press you higher. Now, if the right centre-backs slip to the right, instead of dropping off to give the angle of support where he could receive the ball, the other team can't squeeze up the pitch. He still gives the angle of support where he can play, but he's also open, still opening up a pass for somebody else on the inside. So it was just something that, that Rafa was really keen on, and he had this one practice, six on the outside, uh, one in the middle and three defenders in the middle. So you essentially had your, it was like your, your 10 players and they would have that replicated twice. And you had to play two touch on the line, person in the middle was on two touch, one defender in, one defender out, depending on who won the ball. Um, but again, great practice just for working on support and angles and making it realistic, I think, to what should happen rather than taking the easy option. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, time and spot on. We've just got a few questions to to run through that came through um, when people signed up uh, to this, Ben and Neil. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quite a few around the syllabus. So um, if you're working towards something uh, with your grassroots team, um, would you change your syllabus to some, you know, what's happening on a Saturday or a Sunday, as in performance-wise, um, or would you stick with what you 
what you've been working on for the last two or three weeks or longer? I think it, for me, guys, it depends on on how you what your your model or your philosophy of work is. Like I said at the start, we've we've moved away from schemes of work as such in blocks. And we've gone more down the route of, especially the 9s to 16s, the syllabus is set for the whole season. Mm-hmm. There's no need to change for who we're playing against or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's about making sure that they get the right practice of, of all the different moments and the principles of play within that. Uh, for the 18s and 23s, they would work on the four moments throughout the week, but what they work on isn't set. So... All I say to, obviously I say to Neil, I say to, to Kev, to, to Chris and to Liam at 23s is you you make the decision on what you're going to work on within the four moments of the game this week and just make sure that you get a balance of it across the season. So there's a bit more flexibility at 18 23s when you start doing a little bit of analysis on the opposition. Um, but for me, it's, it's still all about us and what we do. We're not at that. And even at that first team level, some teams operate like that where none are to about us and we're just going to, this is what we do. Some first teams decide that they're going to change shape or style week to week based on who they're playing against. Uh, for the majority of our work at the academy, it's none are. This is what we do. There's the syllabus. That's it set. And we, I've kind of, I made the decision probably a couple of years ago when I knew I was stepping into the role to kind of take all that responsibility away and just allow the coaches to focus on the the planning and the doing because that's the bit that they enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. They enjoy designing the practices as you can see Neil does and they enjoy the delivery of it. That's the bit that you want to do as a coach. Um, And I, I think just think of the example in the states where they have these like head of coaching roles or coaching coordinator roles or on the continent it's like head of methodology or whatever they take that responsibility of like look here's the syllabus you plan you plan the practices because you know the players best and, yeah. and go from there yeah Neil um, one for you and you touched on it earlier in your presentation the, the importance of your, your analysis behind your thinking of what you want the players to do and how you back how you're backing that up um, because I think saying something to a player and especially if you're going back to the, the, the coaches on the on the uh, webinar the night that how were they? the importance of them backing up what they're trying to get the players to do in a training session? Mm. Um, I mean, I, 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 it depends It depends on resource, really, I, I think. Yeah. If, you've got, if you've got resource to do it, and I see you know, a lot of Northern League clubs now in the area who are advertising for analysts and people are coming video their games, I mean, there's, no, there's just no getting away from video in terms of analysing in reviewing and I think when you go to do your coaching badges now and I haven't been around that for for a while that a lot of that's done via video and then review with the tutor and sitting looking back at the performance but I think if you've got if you've got the, the capability of doing it and obviously there's there's data protection stuff around video and sessions and games and things like that but if you've got the chance to do it it is the best way of reviewing if you can I think if if you if you haven't got that, I think you can, like I said before, you can use uh, hand and hand written analysis if you want uh, notation analysis um, to, to to either inform your thinking or to back up your thinking. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. I, I, one of the FA tutors who looks after the northeast came and watched a session about a year ago. I think it was. And uh, sorry, it was a game. We watched the game, and it was we just put the video camera on me, and I was mic'd up, and we did a split screen of the game, and we did a split screen with me on and, and hearing what I'm saying, because I was really interested in who I was talking to during the game, and is it am I talking to the people close to the touchline all the time, close to me? Uh, what's the balance between that and speaking to the people on the far side? 
what's the balance of it being positive and negative? Um, but also, what, what did I look like? And the answer was uh, loud, close to me, and frustrated. Well, and, but somebody could have told me that. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Once you see it, and I think if you use the same thing with players, once they've got the, the facts and if, if you've got the footage in front of them, it's a really powerful thing. And it doesn't always have to be done for a negative reason. It, it should be done a lot of yeah. the time for positive reasons. To, to, to say, look, at, watch this. I mean, I'll give, I'll give you another example. I, I can remember, not this, probably a couple of years ago, showing a player... Still there, Neil? I am back. Ben, are you there? I am back. Ben, just, just, just a one for you. Um, the importance of as, as coaches, do we, do we get enough? Do we actually ask for feedback enough of of the players that we're coaching? As in the review process, Neil mentioned it earlier. Yeah, I th I think you have to be comfortable receiving it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people skirt that a lot of the time because they don't want to hear what's going to come back. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it at times it's it's a good tool and a good method, but I would be selective about what it is that you actually want them to review on. So if it was um, your manner and your style of delivery, I think is always a good one because that will give you an indication as to whether the players are going to take the messages on board or not. Um, I think certainly with the younger age groups, ask them about enjoying, enjoying the practices. Is definitely definitely one. It, it, the slightly older age groups, I've had this discussion with some of the lads before where it's like, you know, oh, well, we don't really need or don't really like that that practice or that type of practice. But actually, for some of our older lads, it's like, well, look, yeah, we get that. But actually, it's a necessity for you. Because if you don't learn how to do this and this is the best way of doing it, you're not going to make that step to the next level. So there's, there's a, a little bit of... You have to understand what the, the players' understanding and knowledge is as well. Um, and you also have to be really skilled at how you ask for that feedback mm -hmm. so that it doesn't just become a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. uh, so your, your question that you're asking people to feed back on has to be really clear. If you leave it open-ended, you could end up with all sorts coming back. But certainly it, it should be part of your box. I wouldn't use it all of the time. I would use it when you think it's appropriate. Mm. Again, it, it's that art that Neil spoke about. It's, you get a feel for you know, when you should, you should ask them rather yeah. than it becoming just something that you do every week or every yeah. second. Yeah. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, so one more, um, and this one's for Neil because uh, he has, I'm sure you still have the same issues now with Mr. Dawson next to you than we did a few years ago at uh, West Lockman in Ashton. How do we, we can plan as much as you want and uh, the detail that I know you do and in grassroots and uh, non-league you might get uh, an hour before we're due to train and um, you may get parents stuck in traffic and um, you might have players who have had to go to work. How do we deal with that within the plan do review or the best ways mm -hmm. to get around it? I'm just hoping I didn't get cut off yet, Gary, on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm Sky Plus and Coronation Street and me broadband. It's not happy. Um, I, I think, again, Ben, ben mentioned... Because Neil, you have the same problems in Newcastle as we did, as yeah, we did yeah. many years ago, don't, don't you? It happens to yeah. everyone. Yeah. I think 
I mean, there's, there's, there's probably two things I would say here, and I can only speak for myself, and I'm sure that there'll be people out there who have got a better answer than the one I'm going to give. Uh, I think I think contingency planning is obvious, an obvious one, is, is what's plan B if numbers are wrong or the pitch is not right or whatever. So I would... I would have a contingency plan in mind. And then when all else fails, uh, you're at that moment where, and I can remember when we used to walk across that bridge up at uh, Hearst Welfare and you're getting calls saying that there's 12 players not coming and we've got three. <laughs> I think in them situations, deep down inside you, you've got your favourite practices. They're the ones you would do if you were interviewed for a job that you just know work and that you know that the players like and that... They don't take a lot of setting up and you can just get them going and the players have done them for m- before. So it's a bit of familiarity. And I think in that moment where you're probably stressed and panicking and thinking on the spot, I think you should take solace and comfort in stuff that's familiar to you and stuff that's familiar to them. And if it's familiar to them, it's probably because you've done it a few times and there's a chance then in, that you've done it a few times because they like it. So it might not be what you want to do, but you might be forced into a corner where you've got to go into something that is like, yeah, yeah, maybe it's your third choice. Um, but I do think, oh, oh, if I go right back to my practices before, I, I always think there's a way of manipulating what you want to do to the numbers that you have. So those practices that I showed you tonight, I think of that one with the four on the outside and the one in the box in the middle. You could have any amount of people on the side of that. And, and Ben's talking there, Rafa had X amount of players on the outside, and X amount in the middle. You can manipulate them if you think about it. And I think those are the best practices. It's the ones where you, I need that and then you don't get that. And then all of a sudden you're in a panic mode. Uh, so the practices that aren't massively number reliant, have some of them as your contingency. And if all else fails and you're panicking beyond belief, go back to the fail safes mm-hmm. would be my advice. Yeah. And I've done that a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, just, just, to, just to wrap things up, um, I got a message off Helen just before when we were on about analysis, Neil, and the Northumberland FA have got a partnership with the, the VEO um, camera. So I think we're going to be able to share that around the, the, the county. So if, if people are interested in that, um, they can get in touch with her. Um, Helen, is there anything that you want to touch on before I wrap up? Uh- I, I just think that um, just what you're saying about the VO cameras, um, we're going to be sharing a little bit of information about that later this week yeah. um, and we'll be able to to arrange demonstrations if people are interested in that. So um, keep a look on social media for that one coming out later on this week. Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. Um, and thank you very much for everyone uh, who's joined us tonight. Um, I'm sure you've found it extremely insightful um, and a massive thanks to you, Ben and Neil, uh, for sharing your, your knowledge and expertise. And hopefully um, we'll see you soon when we can get out on the on the pitches at some stage in the, in the coming months. I think, guys, just, just from my point of view and, and certainly look ahead with the club, I think it would be great to have invite everybody down at some stage and actually see some of the staff working and doing what we've spoken about tonight. Neil and I had this conversation earlier in the week about, like, it's great doing these and everybody can talk a good game, but actually getting out on the grass is where you earn your money and where you find out if people are any good. So there's no pressure on Neil when everyone comes to watch him. Um, <laughs> but I think we'll we'll sort something out where we can invite everybody to come into the club and, and see how how some of the staff work and what they do. That'll be fantastic, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.